a new lunar lander is on its way to the moon, Starship undergoes a launch rehearsal, and Falcon 9 flies for the 300th time. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 16th of February, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. In rocketry, having pathfinders, stage simulators, and other such things can be really helpful to put your ground systems to the test and to rehearse moving your rocket to the pad. Well, that's exactly what Blue Origin has done this week with its new Glenn rocket. We've talked about it over the last few weeks. Blue Origin is slowly but surely ticking down milestones as it prepares for the first test flight of new Glenn. In recent months, the company had moved the Pathfinder first and second stages to the hangar at Launch Complex 36. But also in that hangar were the simulators for the first and second stages of New Glenn that Blue Origin has used thus far to test handling procedures. It was these two vehicles that were mated together, put on the transporter erector, and then rolled out to the launch pad just this past week. Our photographer Max Evans captured these shots of this first simulated stack as it sat vertical on the pad after rollout. These pictures now give us an idea of how the actual final vehicle should look once out on the pad, hopefully later this year. But don't let these images deceive you. New Glenn looks tiny compared to its nearby ground support system, but it is really a big rocket. Just to put it all into perspective, it's about as tall as NASA's Space Launch System rocket and just a bit thinner at 7 meters rather than 8.4 meters for the SLS core stage. Now, of course, with New Glenn's vehicle access tower being 175 meters tall, the tallest launch tower at the Cape, by the way, a 98 meter tall rocket can definitely look small. Hopefully the next steps will likely entail removing the simulator stages and replacing them for the Pathfinder stages, which have actual tanks and plumbing. These would likely be able to undergo cryogenic testing on the pad and test the ground support systems that fuel New Glenn during its countdown. It'll be interesting to see when Blue puts an actual flight article vehicle on the pad, but hopefully we'll find that out sooner rather than later. And now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Soyuz 2.1V. Yes, the one without the boosters. Liftoff took place on February 9th at 7.03 UTC from Site 43-4 at the Plisets Cosmodrome in Russia. The rocket was carrying a classified payload for the Russian Ministry of Defense into a sun-synchronous orbit. Now, due to the classified nature of the launch, not much is known about it other than that it was given the designation of Cosmos 2575 once it reached orbit, as is usual for these payloads. After several delays due to weather, we finally had the launch of Starlink Group 713. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 from Vandenberg took place on February 10th at 34 minutes past midnight UTC. As expected from the mission name, the rocket was carrying another batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1071, was flying for a 14th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. From the east coast of the United States, we had another Falcon 9 launch taking place on February 14th at 2230 UTC. The mission, called USS F-124, was flying six prototype missile tracking satellites for the U.S. Department of Defense into a low Earth orbit. Two of these six satellites are part of the Missile Defense Agency's Hypersonic and Ballistic Tracking Space Sensor Program. One of them is built by L-3 Harris and the other by Northrop Grumman. These satellites will be in charge of detecting and tracking not only missiles, but also dim targets such as hypersonic vehicles gliding through the atmosphere. The other four satellites are part of the Space Development Agency's Tranche Zero constellation, in particular its tracking layer. These satellites, built by L3 Harris, were supposed to launch last year as part of the main two launches of the Tranche Zero constellation. Tracking layer satellites also perform a similar task as they're in charge of detecting and tracking hypersonic targets, but their field of view is much wider, allowing them to potentially detect a greater number of targets if necessary. They're also equipped with the latest inter-satellite laser link technology, similar to those used on modern satellite constellations like Starlink and Kuiper. And fun fact, while these four tracking layer satellites were built by L3 Harris, the other four were built by SpaceX. Needless to say, we all hope these satellites never have to be used in a real-life scenario. For this mission, the second stage sported a mission extension kit, which included a gray band on its kerosene tank to keep it warm during extended mission durations. This is likely due to the transit time that was needed to insert all six satellites into the roughly 1,000-kilometer orbit. 
The first stage for this mission, B-1078, was flying for a seventh time and it successfully landed back on land at SpaceX's landing zone 2. And yes, that's landing zone 2 because, as you will see later, SpaceX had two return to launch site landings planned for that same day. But before that other launch, all the way over in Kazakhstan, we had the launch of a Soyuz 2.1A carrying the latest Progress spacecraft to the International Space Station. Liftoff took place on February 15th at 325 UTC from Site 316 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Progress MS-26 spacecraft is carrying 2.5 tons of cargo to the ISS, of which 1.5 tons are hardware and equipment for the station's systems and science experiments. Ahead of its launch, the Progress MS-24 spacecraft undocked from the ISS Zvezda module on February 13th at 2.09 UTC. That cleared the docking port for the Progress MS-26 to dock on February 17th at 6.12 UTC, or about two days after launch. This week we had a new lunar lander on its way to the moon with the launch of Intuitive Machine's first Nova Sea lander on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Liftoff took place on February 15th at 6.05 UTC from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This was the first Nova Sea lander from Intuitive Machines, which the company named Odysseus. Odysseus is the first lunar lander carrying cryogenic propellants instead of storable hypergolic propellants. It uses a mix of liquid oxygen and liquid methane for its main propulsion system. This meant that SpaceX needed to modify the launch pad systems at LC-39A to accommodate the loading of this liquid oxygen and liquid methane onto Odysseus during the rocket's countdown. Now, Normally, spacecraft using hypergolic propellants tend to be loaded several weeks before launch as they're stable and they don't really boil off, but with cryogenic propellants, this is not the case, hence the need to have this system in place. This also means it needs to get to the moon quickly instead of going on a lower energy trajectory so that it can retain as much of its propellant as possible. Odysseus is set to attempt its lunar landing about a week after launch on February 22nd. Its landing location will be near the south pole of the moon on the Malapert A crater and, if it lands successfully, this would be the southernmost landing on the moon so far. The lander carries a set of cameras and lasers that allow it to identify the terrain that it's flying over and to guide itself to the landing site. Once closer to the surface, a hazard navigation software selects the best location for landing and the lander performs its terminal descent. On board Odysseus, there are six NASA payloads and six commercial payloads. The six NASA payloads are flying as part of the agency's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, often referred to as the CLPS program. The six NASA payloads consist of a charged particle detector, a small laser retroreflector array, a device set to measure propellant quantities in tanks using radio waves, an experimental laser navigation system, an experimental lunar positioning device, and a set of cameras to study plume interactions from the dust that's kicked up by the engine. As part of the commercial payloads, the lander's closeout panel that protects its cryogenic tanks uses Columbia Sportswear's OmniHeat technology to reflect as much sunlight as possible. Another commercial payload includes the ILO-X experiment from the International Lunar Observatory to perform observations of the Milky Way from the lunar surface. But more interestingly, Odysseus carries a commercial payload called Eagle Cam, which has been developed by Embry-Riddle Space Technology Laboratory. Eagle Cam is a small CubeSat-sized camera system that will be ejected from Odysseus at about 30 meters from the lunar surface and will try to take pictures of the lander as it approaches the surface. So here's hoping Odysseus gets down to the ground successfully and that Eagle Cam is able to give us some amazing shots of that. As of recording, the latest update from Intuitive Machines says that the lander is healthy even though it had a small glitch with its navigation system soon after deployment from Falcon 9. Thankfully, teams were able to quickly resolve this and Odysseus is receiving solar power, communicating with the ground, and it's on its way to the moon. But let's not forget about another landing during this mission. The first stage of the Falcon 9 for this mission, B-1060, was flying for an 18th time, becoming one of the life leaders of the Falcon 9 booster fleet. It successfully landed back on land at SpaceX's Landing Zone 1 just a few hours after the other landing at Landing Zone 2 from the USS F-124 mission. The fourth and last Falcon 9 launch of the week took place from Vandenberg on February 15th at 2134 UTC. The rocket was carrying another batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. This mission marked Falcon 9's 300th launch overall, once again triggering the debate of what counts and what doesn't count as a launch. And that's because while it was the 300th launch, it was technically the 301st mission if you include Amos 6 in that list, 
It was a Falcon 9 mission, but it never launched, so does it count as a launch? And if you want more stats, that 300 launch number, it also includes the Crew Dragon in-flight abort test. So if you only count orbital launches, then that number would actually be 299 rather than 300. Also in more statistics, this launch broke SpaceX's shortest time for three consecutive launches at just over 23 hours to perform USS F-124, the Nova Sea launch, and this launch, Starlink Group 714. As you can see, tracking rocket statistics can be just as hard, if not harder, than launching said rockets. But Falcon 9's first stage flew not only up, but also back down for a landing. The first stage for this mission, B-1082, was flying for a second time and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. But wait, this was the 200th landing in a row since the last landing failure. Yeah, 200th! And that is beyond what any rocket has been able to launch successfully in a row, let alone being able to land successfully. Well, except Falcon 9 itself. With the two Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,850 satellites into orbit, of which 390 satellites have re-entered, and 4,706 are in their operational orbit. SpaceX continues to move forward with pre-launch testing ahead of Starship's third test flight. If you watched last week's episode and the latest Starbase update, you may remember that SpaceX rolled Booster 10 and Ship 28 out to the launch site for combined testing. These were then stacked, de-stacked, then restacked again. And frankly, it was a little bit of a mess, and it kind of brings back memories from the last pair of Starship vehicles. Those were stacked eight times before they finally launched. But thankfully, SpaceX then went into preparations for a wet dress rehearsal to rehearse the launch countdown and procedures ahead of launch. So this wet dress rehearsal was first attempted on February 14th, but it was aborted shortly after the start of propellant load. It's not clear what happened for this test to be aborted, but teams had already had some trouble going into operations earlier in the day. Since Starship's second flight, a lot of the ground systems have been upgraded, which means that there were a lot of new lessons to be learned, as well as a lot of pains to be had while testing them. So it's not completely a surprise to see that this test was aborted. The abort came after several hours of tank farm spool up and chill down of propellant lines to the launch mount and the launch tower. This was followed by only a small amount of propellant being loaded onto the booster and the ship, which is when the abort occurred. So we could say that instead of a wet dress rehearsal, this was more like a damp dress rehearsal. SpaceX team spent the entire day of Thursday, February 15th fixing the ground systems, and a new attempt at this test happened on Friday morning. Here's Ryan with an update on how this testing went. Well, Alicia, unfortunately, it looks like Friday went pretty much the same as Wednesday. The road was closed, tank farm spooled up, propellant load started, and then another hold. This time around, though, the propellant load proceeded a lot further into the count, with all four main tanks on Starship being visibly frosty. It's not clear what happened to scrub the test again on Friday, but it definitely shows how complicated it is to test a rocket so huge like Starship. Another road closure is possible on Tuesday from 8am to 8pm Central Time, but that'll be a thing to cover next week on Starbase Update. This all happened right as we got breaking news of SpaceX looking to place a Starship launch pad or launch pads at Cape Canaveral. SpaceX and the Space Force have started the environmental study process to build a Starship launch pad at Space Launch Complex 37. This is the same launch pad currently being used by ULA's Delta IV Heavy rocket, but that rocket has an expiration date. Its final launch is currently planned for next month. With no rockets expected to be launching from Slick 37 in the near term, it's the right location for SpaceX to grab and launch Starship from. This launch complex will join Launch Complex 39A at the neighbouring Kennedy Space Centre, which also has a Starship launch pad, although it is currently mothballed. It's definitely going to be interesting to see how it all pans out in the next few years as SpaceX builds more and more Starship launch pads and increases the rocket's cadence. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. NASA has selected its next wide-field observatory, the UVEX Telescope. With this selection, UVEX, which stands for Ultraviolet Explorer, is now officially part of NASA's Explorers program. This telescope will observe ultraviolet wavelengths of light, allowing it to study some of the most energetic events in the universe. The observatory will be equipped with a wide field of view instrument that will allow it to survey a massive portion of the sky in a relatively short amount of time. Its advanced instruments and technology will provide much more precise observation in the ultraviolet spectrum, with just a slightly larger size compared to prior observatories. 
With its launch set for 2030, UVEX will join a growing list of wide-field observatories in different wavelengths of light. This list includes the recently launched Euclid telescope that can observe in the near-infrared and optical spectrum. We've also had the launch of the Einstein probe, which is another wide-field observatory, but in X-rays. And around 2027, we'll have the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which will also observe in near-infrared and optical wavelengths. SpaceX is planning to deorbit 100 Starlink satellites on purpose. According to the company, it has identified an issue in about 100 of the early version 1 Starlink satellites that would increase their probability of failure in the future. To avoid this becoming a potential hazard in orbit, SpaceX is in the process of decommissioning these satellites by deorbiting them in a controlled manner. This would be the largest decommissioning of Starlink satellites so far, with 390 satellites having re-entered already since 2019. About a dozen others are still in orbit in a non-maneuverable state and slowly undergoing orbital decay, so they're due to re-enter back to Earth in the near term too. The company is not too worried about losing this number of satellites though, as it says it can produce up to 55 of them each week. And as we see on every episode of This Week in Spaceflight, they sure launch a lot of them each month. With the current launch cadence, SpaceX will likely compensate for this loss of satellites within two or three weeks, so it really shouldn't affect customer service. And now, let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. After a few days of delay due to weather, JAXA's H3 rocket is ready to give it another try for launch next week. The next launch attempt is set to occur within a 3 hour 44 minute window that opens on February 17th at 22 minutes past midnight UTC. India is set to launch next week with its GSLV Mark II rocket carrying the INSAT 3DS satellite into orbit. The launch is currently planned for February 17th at 12.05 UTC. Electron's second launch of the year is on track to launch next week on February 18th at 1452 UTC. The mission, called On Closer Inspection, will carry the Address J spacecraft, which will be meeting in orbit with the spent upper stage of an H2 rocket. A Falcon 9 is set to launch next week from Florida, carrying the Telcomsat HTS-113BT communications satellite. The 2 hour 33 minute launch window opens on February 20th at 2011 UTC. Another Starlink mission is on tap next week from Vandenberg, with the Starlink Group 715 mission taking place on February 21st in the early morning UTC time, which would be late evening on the 20th local time. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.